so uh, basically today's lecture is going to be i mean pretty short so uh, we already covered the different aspects of confined fluids and uh, so i'll just try to sum up the things today and uh, if you have any questions then just put those questions in the chat box and the questions are like you know if there are scientific questions related to the course content or if you have any curiosities or any questions regarding the uh, your future uh, career prospects in you know for research in soft condensed matter and confined fluids if you want to know more about that just feel free to uh, post those questions i'll try to address them as much as possible so um yeah so basically uh, today what i'll do uh, is that i'll just try to go through a few examples like a few short exercises and uh, i hope the homeworks that i gave you you already went through them so that you don't have any questions from them but if you have any questions from the homework then just let me know okay we can cover them as well so like you saw in the last couple of days so we started with the basic uh, concepts of phases and phase transitions uh, what are the different properties of critical point we uh, looked at different static and dynamic quantities surface properties if you have fluids which are in contact with surfaces how do the properties change as compared to bulk we looked at something called the finite size effect and finite size scaling uh looked at some properties from computer simulations then yesterday we looked at the interesting uh property of non equilibrium dynamics in confined fluids critical casimir forces and i uh explained to you in greater detail something uh a bit technical aspect although uh the active motion of janus colloidal particles which is now a very hot topic in the uh you know in the area of confined fluids uh, surface critical phenomena etc active matter okay so i just thought that today i'll do a have a brief uh, exercise and uh, it's mainly related to the surface directed spinodal decomposition which i explained to you before so this is the method this kahnhiliad equation which i explained to you uh, in the last couple of days when you saw that i started with the free energy functional and i told you that starting with this free energy functional one can arrive at the uh, the time dependent uh, equation which actually explains to you how one can relate the time dependence of the order parameter to different terms appearing in the free energy uh now the question is uh, so if if you want to start with the free energy yeah so the question is that when you are actually doing the uh, the calculation yeah be it the analytical calculation or you want to do it uh, for the sake of the numerical uh, solution you start with the free energy functional which is basically uh, dimensional it has the full dimension of energy and all other terms and now the question is starting with that uh, equation which is fully dimensional how can i can you arrive at the non dimensional form of it okay and this is something extremely important uh, when you look at research papers and you actually want to do the uh, the research on these things why is it so because um, first of all if you have to solve the equations it's much easier to solve the equations in terms of the non dimensional quantity okay and then the idea is the following you start with a complicated equation which is the full dimensional uh, form if you can make it much simpler in terms of making it non dimensional it's very easy for you to solve those equations numerically even in case in case of analytical calculations as well and once you solve it then the idea is that you plug in the quantities uh, the relations between the non dimensional quantities and the dimensional quantities so that then you can finally have an idea about the actual numbers which you should get from the uh, the calculation okay so this will be pretty uh, important if you can actually understand how one can use the uh, the non dimensionalization method to make the equations much simpler which are actually used in the uh, the research purpose yeah so i'll just give you one example with this kahnhiliad equation uh, remember that this is a standard procedure which is followed in you know different fields basically uh, 
uh, this is the basic method which is followed. So I'll just give you one example, then you know how you know the things actually work out. So say let's start with this equation one. Equation one is the full uh, dimensional form of the ginsburg landau free energy functional, where this capital H is the free energy. It's a functional, so it, it, it depends on the order parameter psi, and psi depends on the space coordinate r, okay? That's why it's a functional, right? So I hope you know the difference between a functional functional by now. So as you can see from here, it's a functional, and then to make it dimensionless, basically downstairs we have KBTC, right? So it's energy by energy, which is making it dimensionless. On the right-hand side, we have these different terms, which have different dimensions, okay? And now the question is, starting with this equation, how can you arrive at the non-dimensional form of the kahn hilliard equation? And that equation is basically given in this equation two here, okay? So if you look at equation two, all the parameters have now become non-dimensional. What is the benefit of that? I give you this equation, equation two. You can solve it very easily using any kind of computer simulation method, numerical method. So that if you know the initial value of psi and t, you can get their value at the later times. And then once you know the non-dimensional value of psi and t, if you know the relation between the non-dimensional form of psi and the dimensional form, you can just plug in that relation and then you can get the actual value, okay? So that's the standard procedure which is used. So essentially the exercise is the following, starting with equation one, use certain, uh, you know, such certain relations between the dimensional and the non-dimensional ones, such that you arrive at equation two. That's the idea, okay? Now, before showing you uh, the actual process, how to do it, let me give you the answer as well. So finally, what you should obtain, uh, you should actually get these equations, okay? So these are the relations between the dimensional ones and the non-dimensional ones. The left ones, so the zero, the ones with the suffix zero, those are basically the non-dimensional ones, okay? And uh, the right-hand side ones are actually the quantities which have the dimensions, but they have been, they are, uh, you know, tuned in such a way that it gives you the uh, appropriate relations. So that's what we have to now do. Uh, starting from equation one, let's see how can we get this equation such that we can get equation two. Okay. All right, so that's what we are going to see now. So I'm going to share another uh, screen with you. Uh, basically, yeah, so the idea is the following, that um, you start with this full uh, ginsburg landau free energy functional form where equation one, where basically all the quantities have now the full dimensions and now the idea is the following. Let's see, in this equation, if you remember, like I explained to you yesterday, you have a conserved order parameter dynamics in the system, yeah? which means that you have a continuity equation. And what do I mean by continuity equation? It means that you have a concentration current in the system, right? So there is a conserved quantity and you have a current here. And that's the reason, if you look at the time dependence of the order parameter, so basically, if you look at del psi del t plus the divergence of the current, that should give me zero, right? It's a concept dynamics. So this is what is written in this expression here, that if you have del psi del t, it's equal to minus divergence of the current and where this current then you can relate to the mobility capital M as well as the chemical potential gradient, grad of mu, yeah? Where mu is the chemical potential. Now this chemical potential, you can relate it to the free energy of the system, right? So it's basically the chemical potential is actually the, you can take the partial derivative of the free energy and that will give the mu. Now, if you plug in this relation between the chemical potential and F in this equation here, where you have divergence of J and you know J is actually equal to M times grad mu, what you obtain is that the del psi del T equal to the Laplacian of the derivative of the free energy, okay? 
So now finally, if you started this, uh, the first equation here, which is actually giving you the, uh, the, the functional form of this free energy, what you obtain is this equation, where now this del psi del t you have written down in terms of the different parameters which were appearing before in the functional form of the free energy. Okay, but note that this quantities, this equation is fully dimensional. Okay, so you have it, it has the dimensional quantities. This kBTc, uh, the chemical potential, sorry, the mobility, aim, and all the terms. So let's see how to make it dimension this. Now, in order to do that, the method that we follow is the following. So let's try to do a rescaling method. Okay, and what do I mean by that? Let's say that the start variables they refer to the variables which are actually dimension less. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to write all the dimension less variables, like say size star, as the ratio between the scale variable, between the, uh, the dimensional variables, the original variables psi, with to a parameter, psi zero, okay? So this psi zero will then actually give me the relation between the dimensional one psi as well as the non-dimensional one psi star. So you do the same procedure for all other variables, namely the time, uh, t, the position r, the magnetic field h, etc., or the surface strength h, etc. So now the next step is to find out how you can relate the derivatives in terms of the non-dimensional ones. Yeah? So if you remember the equation, the full dimensional one, it has terms like del del t, it has terms like the Laplacian. So you need to figure out how to write this del del t and the Laplacian in terms of the non-dimensional ones as well. Okay? So that's just a basic mathematics thing. What you have to do is that, you know, you know the relation between, for example, say the t and the t star. So try to find out how you can relate the del del t in terms of the new variable t star. Okay? So it's a just basic mathematics. If you do it, finally, what you obtain is the relation between this, uh, the derivative in terms of the old variable and the new variable, like for time, for position, and so on and so forth. You will get it from the, uh, the Laplacian operator as well. So the next idea will be then just to plug in those, uh, the new variables, okay, in the, the old equation. And if you plug it in, finally, uh, what you will see is that on, uh, so basically on both sides of the equation, you will now get the dimension less variables, okay? And so now let's have a look at this equation. So see, have, have a, just have a look at this equation three now. So this equation three, now I have written down in terms of the dimension less quantities, okay? So on the left-hand side, this del psi t, del t, so it will be del t star actually, this is dimensionless. What it means is the following. For this equation to be dimensionless, it means that if you look at it, this quantity, okay? So this kvtc, mt0 by r0 squared, so the constant term, which is outside, this term times this t tilde. This has to be dimensionless, right? Because if you look at the right hand side, all other variables or all other parameters have already been dimensionless, and the left side is dimensionless, which means that this product, if I look at it, that has to be dimensionless. And you do the same thing for the other terms as well. Okay, so what you have is that this KBTC aim times T0 by R0 square times the temperature T here, that has to be dimensionless. Okay. So you're basically getting now four equations from here. Why four equations? Because you have four terms here. So this t tilde uh, times the outside one, this will give you one term, the first term, second term, third term, and the fourth term. So you have four relations now that all these things are dimensionless. And then if you actually equate or rather relate these equations, what you will get uh, are the relations between these quantities. So for example, you can write the psi zero square in terms of this t tilde and the other quantities. Okay? So for example, let's say if we just equate the, this first equation to the second equation, yeah? what you have is that the t tilde, that is equal to u times psi zero square by six. 
So this will give me the relation between psi zero and this t tilde. Okay. So the same procedure, if you then just uh, follow, what you will obtain is uh, all these, uh, you know, the relations between these uh, parameters like the psi zero, r zero, t zero, uh, h zero, etc. And you can relate them in terms of the parameters which were appearing in the original free energy functional. So the capital C, this U, T tilde, those are the terms which were appearing in the original equation. Okay. So this is the way now I can relate the new dimensionless variable to the quantities or to the parameters which were appearing in the old equation. Okay. For example, if I look at this R0, this R0 has now been related to capital C and T1, which are the terms which are appearing in the original equation. So now if I solve the equation in terms of the dimension less variable R star, if I, at the end of the numerical solution, if I multiply R star by R0, I'll get the actual number, the dimension, uh, dimensional value, okay? All right. So this is the, uh, the basic procedure which is followed. And uh, now if you actually uh, remember, so these are the equations which I showed you before that um, you know you should actually try to obtain these relations basically okay so let me try to So these are the equations which I uh, showed before. All right. By the way, do you see the slides now or it's still the, the other handwritten note which is appearing? Okay. So now uh, the next thing I would like to do is to give you a brief uh, overview about a brief idea about the computational methods which are used for studying this kind of uh, confined fluids. And one very uh, like widely used method is something called the molecular dynamic simulations, MD. Likewise, MD, you can also have Monte Carlo simulations, but uh, the benefit of MD over MC is the following. So, if one is interested in looking at static quantities, it doesn't matter. You can use MC or MD, whatever. You can also use other methods like DPD simulations, Langevin dynamics, etc. But if you want to look at the dynamic properties of a system, there it's always much better to uh, do the MD simulations. Okay, so the MD will then basically give you an idea about the time-dependent properties, which you cannot get from uh, the Monte Carlo simulations because it doesn't really have any real time. Okay. So MD will give you the information in terms of the real time. So what is typically done in MD? Well, the idea is the following, that you have a system which has, uh, say, capital A number of uh, molecules or atoms or particles, whatever. And I want to know the position, velocity, uh, the basically the coordinates of all those n particles as a function of time. Yeah. So I start with the initial time t equal to zero and uh, I let the system evolve. And at every time, I want to know the coordinates of all the particles of the system. Okay. Now, how do we do that? Well, so basically you do it by solving the Newton's equation. So that's what is shown here. So this is nothing but the Newton's equation. I need to know the force which is acting on the particle, say the, uh, the ith particle. And to know the force, basically, I need to know the position of the uh, all, all the particles in the system as well. So this is basically the internal force. And you know that this is related to basically the acceleration of the system, right? So at very early, so the, at the initial time t equal to zero, I know the position of all the particles in the system. I know the velocity of all the particles. Then at every next time t equal to t, I can calculate the force which is acting on all the particles. Yeah. And then if I know the force from there, the idea will be to calculate the position as well as the velocity 
at every time t. And how do you get it? I get it by solving the Newton's equation, right? So this equation will then clearly give me the values of the position as well as the velocity. And you just have to solve this equation, which means that numerically you have to use certain numerical methods to uh, discretize this uh, equation and to get its value. And I think in your MSc course, uh, you must have gone through some kind of you know, numerical methods course where uh, you must have been taught how to solve this kind of second order differential equations numerically such that you get the values of R and R dot. Yeah. Okay, so now the question is that, um, what kind of method are we going to use? So that again depends strictly on the nature of the interparticle potential. What I mean by that is that depending on the nature of this force F, which is acting on the particles, the method that I'm going to use is going to be different. For example, there are certain kind of systems where the interparticle potential is given by the hard sphere potential. What, do, what, what, what does it mean? Well, what it means is the following. If you look at the potential energy, say the capital V, V of R as a function of distance here. So it's a very unique potential where if the separation distance between the two particles is larger than the particle diameter sigma, so if R is larger than sigma, then there is no interaction at all. The interaction potential is zero. And if the particles touch, which means that if R is equal to sigma, then the potential suddenly just shoots up, okay? So either it's zero or it shoots up, which means that at this particular point, R equal to sigma, there is a discontinuity, right? And under such situation, so if your system, uh, if, if the interaction potential is given by this kind of hard sphere potential, you cannot really solve the Newton's equation of uh, Newton's equation, which is mentioned here by the usual uh, methods of, you know, uh, discretization of the equations. Why so? Because clearly the moment you will have, you will come to R equal to sigma, you are going to have a discontinuity, which will, your simulation method is then, or the numerical method is going to break down. You are going to get uh, NAN basically, right? It's going to give you infinity. So for this kind of potential, the usual solution of uh, this second order differential equation that doesn't work out. One needs to employ a different method, which is called event-driven MD simulation. And in this kind of event-driven MD simulation, what one does is the following. One basically needs to track the collisions among these particles, okay? So you have the system where you have multiple particles and these particles are all moving. Excuse me, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, ma'am. Uh, I don't know if it is a problem from my side, but I am not able to see the slides. I still uh -huh. see the nodes. Okay, okay, okay. So, thank you for telling me. Let me just then try it again. Do you see it now? Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so maybe then I'll start from the uh, beginning, okay? So uh, the content of this slide is actually to tell you about the, uh, the MD simulations. And uh, yeah, so why do we need to do the MD simulation? So one method of, you know, trying to computationally understand or characterize the properties of so those uh, confined fluids, which we're talking about, one very widely used simulation method is the MD simulation, okay? Molecular dynamic simulation, where the idea is the following, that um, you have a system where there are say a number of particles, a number of molecules, atoms. And I want to know the position and velocity of all those particles as a function of time, okay? So say at the initial time, t equal to zero, we know the position r and the velocity r dot of all the particles. And now we want to know the position and velocity at the later times t equal to t, okay? And how do we do that? Well, we do that by solving the Newton's equations of motion for all these particles. So I need to know the interaction potential or the force which is acting on all these n particles, which are coming for the, from the n minus one number of uh, other particles. 
So if I can know the internal, if I can know the internal force which is acting on the ith particle, I can then solve the Newton's equation of motion, using which I can then try to get the position and velocity of all these particles at all later times t equal to t. Okay. Now the question is, how do we know the value of this force at every time t? Well, the the way to get that is the following: this interaction potential. That depends on the space coordinate, the position r, right? So at every time, if I know the value of r, I can calculate the force as well. And once I know the force, I can solve the equation, and then I can get r and r dot at all next times. And how do you solve the second order differential equation? Well, for that you need to discretize it, and that is something which I like. I told that I'm sure you must have come across the method in the numerical course, uh, you know, in your MSc studies. So you know how to solve uh, this equation numerically. Okay, so this is the basic idea, all right. I, I, uh, I have a number of particles in the system. I start the system, let it evolve, start starting from the time t equal to zero. At t equal to zero, I know, I know the position and the velocity. I know the functional form of the interaction potential. So I can calculate the force F at all time. Then I can solve the Newton's equation and then I know the position and velocity at every later time t. And this is what is shown here in the second picture. So it's a, it, it, it's just a plot of the interaction potential, okay, which is the force acting on the i particle due to all, you know, n minus uh, one particles. And this is a soft sphere potential because you see that it's a very smoothly varying potential, okay, so at very large distance, the potential is going to zero. And when you are close to the particle, the potential is actually positive, uh, which means that it's becoming repulsive. And this repulsive part is important because remember, then it actually prevents any kind of sticking, right? Or any kind of overlap. The moment the potential will be positive means it's repulsive, means if one particle is trying to come you know, to the uh, second particle, because the potential is now positive, it will now get slightly repelled and there will not be overlap between the particles and that is needed. And if you have a soft potential like this, you just solve the Newton's equations of motion and that method is called the time driven in dissimulation. Okay. Now there might be other kind of interaction potentials like I show in this first picture here. This is something called the hard sphere potential. And for the hard sphere potential, if you compare the two plots here, you can see clearly this is very different. Why? Because if the, inter if the distance from the particle is larger than the particle diameter, the interaction potential is exactly zero. So there's no interaction at all. Whereas if these two particles just touch, you know, it's basically shooting up. Yeah. So either it's zero or it's shooting up. And this is actually problematic if you want to solve the equations, uh, the second order partial different, second order differential equation numerically, because the moment you reach r equal to sigma, you are going to have a discontinuity. So your code is going to give you none. So this method, the time driven MD method, where you solve this equation, this doesn't work out if you have hard sphere potential. And there one actually follows a different method, which is called the even driven MD simulation. And what is that is the following. So you have these particles which are actually moving, right? So you might have collisions among these particles. So one needs to take care of the uh, collision. So you basically need to track all the collisions which are happening. And then you need to apply certain collision rules like you know from you know classical mechanics that there are different kinds of collisions. It can be elastic, inelastic. You need to know the restitution coefficients. Then if I know the velocities of the two particles before the collision, I can apply those collision rules and then I can try to get the velocity right after the collision. Okay, So that way then I can try to find the velocity and the position of this particle. So this is a method which is called the even driven MD simulation. So these are the two widely used MD simulation methods and which kind of method you are going to use that depends on the specific system, the interaction potential uh, among uh, these particles. Okay. All right. Now, uh, this is a method, so it's the usual time-driven MD simulation for the soft spheres, where, like I was telling you, that you have a number of particles which are actually interacting via a potential U, capital U, and uh, we know that it's actually so the force F that is basically nothing but the gradient of the interaction potential, and this you can write as d2x d2t, 
that's the usual uh, the Newton equation. And once you know the functional form, you can actually calculate the total force which is acting on the ith particle. And remember that, so the force acting on the ith particle, if I, let's say it's x component, it's a three dimensional system, let's consider the x component. So that is coming from all other uh, particles basically, which means that it's coming from i equal to one to n, but the i not equal to j. So this is the usual method and a very commonly used interaction potential is something called the Lennard Jones potential, which you see in this picture here, where, uh, so the functional form of this was actually plotted here, okay, where very large distance, it's close to zero. And then if you are very close nearby, beyond sigma, it's actually then uh, repulsive uh, so that the particles won't really overlap. Okay, so this is the basic mechanism. Uh, you start with the interaction potential. So this is the Lena Jones potential, the 12-6 Lena Jones potential. And then you can calculate the force, which is actually, or say the acceleration, which is actually the derivative of this interaction potential. Uh, so you know it's functional form and you just have to plug in this functional form in the, uh, the simulation code. Okay. And uh, yeah, that will give you the force. And at every time, if you can calculate the force, you then know the position and the velocity. Okay, so now uh, the next concept is uh, something called thermostat. So what are thermostats? So basically this MD simulations, which I'm talking about, you can do it in different ensembles, right? And ensembles, I hope you already know now, uh, from must have been taught in the statistical mechanics course. So you know there are different kinds of ensembles, canonical, grand canonical, uh, micro canonical, etc. So if you are doing this MD simulation in the micro canonical ensemble, that means that the total energy is remaining constant, right? Which means the temperature can change. Now say I want to do the simulation of a system where I need to maintain the temperature constant. I can afford for the energy to change, but I need the temperature to remain constant, okay? And in such situations, you need to apply something called thermostats. So what do these thermostats do? These thermostats actually make sure that when you are doing the simulation, the temperature of the system is remaining constant at the value that you want, okay? But, so now think about the system. I have capital N, total number of par uh, particles. I have volume, capital V, energy, total energy, capital E, and I have temperature, capital T. Now, if I apply the thermostat, the total number of particles is remaining constant, volume remaining constant, temperature remaining constant. Which one can change is the total energy, okay? So when you are applying the thermostat, the system is maintaining the temperature, but the total energy of the system can actually decrease. And that is something which actually happens when you look at the systems which are undergoing phase separation, okay? So you start with a initial temperature and you set that this is going to be the quench temperature of the system and the system then tries to minimize its free energy because it's trying to go to the new equilibrium state so the temperature remaining constant but if you look at the energy the energy will gradually decrease okay now this thermostats can once again be of different types okay so depending on uh, the kind of system you are looking at you can have different kinds of thermostats for example the most common ones are called Anderson thermostat, Langevin thermostat, Nozohova thermostat, etc. I'll just tell you what happens in the Anderson thermostat, okay? So there the idea is the following. You have the system which is in contact with a reservoir, okay? Now say that somehow the temperature of my system has gone up. What does it mean? It means that if I look at the total kinetic energy, that has gone up. So I can always relate the temperature with the energy, right? So I can always, this half mb square that I can relate with uh, the degrees of freedom and I can relate it to the temperature. So now if the temperature of the system has gone up, what I do is that few particles from the system go and collide with the reservoir, okay? They lose some energy. That way the temperature of the system goes down and the temperature comes down to the expected value. Similarly, if the temperature goes down, some of the particles go and collide with the reservoir. They absorb some energy so that the temperature of the system goes up. So this way you can always maintain the temperature at the constant or at the desired value where you know you want it uh, to maintain. 
So this is a method uh, which is uh, uh, the, the basic idea behind this uh, thermostat, which is called the Anderson thermostat. And uh, yeah, so there, are, there, there is something else which is called Langevin thermostat as well. Uh, so now the idea is that uh, this Anderson thermostat or the Langevin thermostat, if you apply these thermostats, the dynamics of the system, so that basically becomes stochastic, okay? Because these collisions which I'm talking about, they are stochastic in nature. Hmm? Now, if I want to maintain hydrodynamics preservation in the system, okay? And what I mean by hydrodynamics is that I want the mass, energy, and momentum conservation in the system. Then these thermostats are not the proper ones because they are not going to lead to hydrodynamics conservation because it's stochastic in nature. Okay, so it's going to break the momentum conservation. In such situations, you need to use a different thermostat, which is called the Nosehuber thermostat, and that is of course slightly more complicated one. So I will not get into the details of those uh, Nose-Hoover thermostat because at uh, this level for you, it's not really you know, necessary to get into the details of that. Just have a brief overview, uh, just you know, have an overall idea that there are different kinds of thermostats which people use when they do computer simulations, okay? Like I told you, you can have the Anderson thermostat where these particles are colliding. Uh, it's a stochastic thermostat, okay? On the other hand, if you want to have hydrodynamics preservation, one needs to apply something called the Nose-Hoover thermostat, which is of course a bit more complicated as compared to the Anderson thermostat. And once you apply the thermostats and you do the MD simulations, then what you can do is actually, you know, uh, as a function of time, you can record the position and velocity of all these particles uh, during this non-equilibrium process, which is going on. And you can just, you know, uh, you basically get the data uh, about uh, the dynamics which is going on. Okay, so these are some of the, yeah, I mean, some of the basic uh, principles and basic ideas, you know, behind the MD simulation method uh, to study the confined fluids. So I think with that, I'll just stop today. Uh, I didn't really want to overload you with the information. So I just wanted to give you the brief information uh, to give you an idea about the things which are you know, uh, which are really of interest in the confined fluid community, scientific community, which are the different topics that are uh, of interest to people at the moment, different simulation methods which are used. Uh, if you find uh, those interesting, and if you want to know more about it, then please, you know, just feel free to send me emails. I'll be very happy to send you research papers, books, etc., and uh, you can then read them in detail and you can, you know, yeah, try to increase the depth of the knowledge. So yeah, with that, I would like to thank all of you for attending the lectures for the five days. It was really a very wonderful experience, uh, although it was online, but yeah, it was quite interesting and nice. So thank you all, and I wish you all the best. So thank you. If you have any questions, please feel free to write them in the chat box.